Okay. And I will go ahead and hand it over to Kevin to get everything started. Thanks, Hannah. Um, I see we only have about 45 people. Do we want to give people maybe just a couple more minutes? Yeah, we can give people just a couple more minutes. And Kevin, I'm going to go ahead and make you co-host just in case. <clears throat> And they may be just trickling in here. Let's give everybody about two more minutes or so. I uh, want to see if we can get hopefully a few more people in. We're probably about half our registrations right now. And I have a short presentation, so it'll be okay. Well, shall we begin? Sounds good. Hope everybody is ready and sure. buckled in. Got a good day ahead of us. Um, so good morning, everybody. Um, I'd like to uh, welcome you to the West Virginia Association of Geospatial Professionals uh, 2021 conference and workshop. Um, Glad you're able to join us virtually, if not in person. Uh, hopefully, uh, we'll be able to change that next year. Uh, we have some great speakers and presentations today and tomorrow, uh, along with uh, two very um, excellent workshops. Uh, I'm excited for both of those. Um, we also have uh, an exhibitor session tomorrow and a uh, roundtable discussion with our friends from the surveying industry. So I really encourage you to stick around and uh, join us for that discussion. Um, you do not obviously have to be a surveyor uh, to participate. 
um, but we'd love to have your input. Um, this morning, we're going to begin with a roll call session. Uh, so we'll have updates uh, and hearings from local government, uh, state agencies, and our federal partners uh, with their GIS activities. Uh, and then we'll, we'll have a second part of the roll call. Um, and that's going to be from uh, some of our adjoining states uh, that are going to be able to give us an update of what their activities are and their priorities are, um, as well as some of the um, adjoining uh, society reports, um, such as the surveyors. So uh, we've got a, a packed morning this, uh, this morning, uh, and then this afternoon, um, uh, we'll move into our paper presentations. Um, and there will be two tracks of presentations. Um, so you should be able to see uh, on the schedule on your, um, your conference hub uh, to choose which uh, presentations you'd like to see. Um, and I want to stress that even though uh, we're meeting virtually right now, um, it's really important that you communicate. So um, by all means, um, please participate, um, ask questions, um, and um, you know it, you can have questions in the chat or comments in the chat uh, as well. Um, and I know the the speakers and present uh, presenters would would greatly appreciate it. Um, and then also, this is a great opportunity to meet uh, and talk with some of the exhibitors that have been um, gracious enough to sponsor our conference. So uh, I have just a, a quick short uh, intro, and then I'm going to immediately turn it over to um, uh, the roll call speakers. Uh, so um, bear with me here. This past year has been a challenge for many of us uh, and the board uh, and members of the AGP uh, have been doing what we can to support each other uh, over the year to meet these challenges um, that COVID uh, pandemic has brought us. So it's kind of a hopefully once in a lifetime experience that none of us will have to go through again. But uh, knowing that uh, both their employer and household budgets have been um, kind of strained, uh, the board extended the um, the membership fee this year, again, um, to $15. Um, uh, so that'll be through 2022. Um, we discussed that, we talked about that because um, as you'll see in the, the treasurer's report, um, the AGP is on strong financial uh, footings right now. And we wanted to make sure that people had the opportunity to stay connected, especially in such a time that um, they, may have been isolated from each other and from maybe even their own office. Uh, so, um, you know, we, we wanna make sure that you all have an opportunity to communicate with each other and stay connected. Uh, so that really was an important priority for us. Um, and as you'll hear from our reports later uh, during the business meeting, um, I think we did a good job of trying to do that, uh, trying to maintain some semblance of uh, a normal year, uh, offering trainings even virtually um, so it's been challenging, but um, I think we, we see the light at the end of the tunnel. Um, along those lines, that's also part of the reason why we, we held a, a virtual meeting this year, a virtual conference this year. Um, you know, I, I think we, we had discussed it last fall, uh, whether or not we were going to try again, uh, and we're basically looking out in, in terms of the winter, in terms of planning. So we, we try and plan about a year ahead. Uh, I think we made the decision in January or somewhere about there um, to, to host uh, virtually. Uh, so um, I attended a, a previous conference that was a virtual and um, it, it went pretty well. So I, I was kind of convinced that we could pull it off. Uh, so I hope you uh, find uh, the speakers informative and engaging, um, and um, hopefully we can be together next year uh, in person. Okay. Um, so with the restrictions on budget and travel, I know a lot of us have experienced. Um, I feel like that this has been a really productive year uh, for us as an association. Um, I know member, many of our members have learned to adapt and uh, find new ways of collaborating with each other uh, and to make do with what we have. So 
Um, I know some people have been using Slack. Uh, our office has been using Teams. Um, I know a few others have been switching over to the Google uh, Chat, Google Hangouts um, uh, to maintain the, the communications. Uh, so um, I hope that can be one of the takeaways from, from this experience that we'll be able to, to more readily uh, pick up and use these tools to, to offer that communication, um, not only within your own office, but also um, across across offices. Um, so there are challenges ahead. Uh, we know that we probably understand most of us that you know, we'll probably be in some budget restrictions for the foreseeable future. Um, so you know, I, I hope that we'll be able to offer our uh, support to each other, um, to our agencies that we we work for, our businesses that we work for, um, and be able to. Um, really uh, show the power of GIS and improve the efficiencies uh, uh, of our of our tasks. So with that, um, I really encourage you to, um, it's my hope that we can continually improve uh, how we communicate, how we collaborate and support each other in bringing spatial information and skills to West Virginia. Um, I hope that you pass on your knowledge and those skills that you've developed to others, uh, not only to build your own team up, uh, but also experience um, your share your experiences uh, and expertise uh, with others uh, so that they too can benefit. Um, and I feel like that's part of the core mission of the AGP. Um, and as a member, uh, one of your goals, and I also encourage you to be an active participant. Uh, with that, uh, I'd really like to recognize and thank um, our sponsors for this year's annual conference. Um, Atlas Geographic and ESRI um, are both gold level sponsors, um, both uh, pretty well known in the state uh, for their contributions to the GIS community. And I uh, really want to stress that it's more than uh, just the monetary contribution of sponsorship for this, this conference. Um, Routinely, um, you know, I've seen uh, Atlas's team go out of their way. Um, sometimes that literally means driving hours, um, you know, to different counties to offer support um, or to stop in uh, at a at a client's uh, office to, you know, check on things. How are things going? Um, I know Esri does that constantly. Um, we we really need to, as a state, take advantage of the resources that we have and. Um, I feel like we're, we're blessed with some great um, vendor support um, in the state. Um, so um, I wanna extend my thanks for them. Um, and at the same time, um, uh, we have a few new sponsors this year. Um, the city of Martinsburg um, has sponsored our conference. So welcome, I'm glad you're uh, able to join us. Um, and then also I'd like to recognize uh, Precision Laser and Duncan Parnell, um, both of whom who have been servicing uh, kind of the GIS community in West Virginia for, for years. I'm not sure how long, but I've been around for a while and I recognize both those names constantly. Uh, and I know that they have continued support for both uh, the association uh, for what we do here and then also for uh, the state in general. Um, so um, again, I'm, I'm proud to have them as sponsors and I, I greatly appreciate their contributions um, to what we're doing. Uh, with that being said, um, just wanna offer my final thanks um, to um, the individuals that put time and energy into the association. Um, and that means the board specifically, but also the members who contribute to um, the activities that we do. Um, and that could be training, uh, that could be uh, working on the website. Um, there are an endless task list uh, of things that occur, even if you're not really familiar, that go on behind the scenes all year. Um, and it really does take effort in a team uh, to, to kind of make this agency or this, uh, this organization work. Uh, so I really wanna extend my thanks uh, to them. Uh, lastly, uh, I also want to thank the JewelNet team. They've been outstanding to work with, um, and and I, I think you'll see uh, through today and tomorrow that they they do such an awesome job putting on a professional conference. Um, we've been working with them both in person, and we we used their services last year, and um, it's just great to have them on to uh, on board. So. Um, 
take a lot of stress and burden off of uh, off of the board to, to put these conferences together. Uh, so with that being said, um, I, I, I greatly appreciate you all being here this morning uh, and uh, I'm looking forward to the presentation. So thank you to all the presenters that uh, volunteered to, to, to talk about what they're up to. Um, and with that being said, I think we're gonna turn it over to um, Tony and uh, give us an update. Uh, and then we'll jump into the roll call. Uh, so again, thanks for being here. Uh, I look forward to, to speaking with you. Okay, I'm not sure if Tony made it on this morning. Tony, are you here? Okay, if he's not, that's fine. We can just go ahead and go right into the roll call. Let me get the PowerPoint pulled up. We will start with the um, local roll call. Just getting my presentation pulled up here. And screen sharing. All right, can you all see the- um, Yep, we have the title slide. Do what? Yes, we have the, we see the title slide. Great, cool. So let's go ahead and start with our local roll call here. Marvin Davis, are you here? Yes, I am. Cool, all right, the floor is yours. Okay, so I'm uh, Marvin Davis with the city of Morgantown. Uh, as uh, Kevin alluded to, we, we kind of been dealing with a little bit with COVID-19 as well from a project and budgetary standpoint. Um, we were forced to work remotely for roughly about six weeks. Uh, and um, some of the challenges that we uh, dealt with were um, immediate cuts to uh, our contracted services budgeting and our project bu uh, budgeting that we had uh, approved at the time uh, we were planning on getting a few projects off and running and then also um, a full uh, uh, budget for our uh, consulting firm to uh, aid us in our uh, onboarding of departments. Uh, another uh, crux of the uh, 2020 uh, calendar year was uh, we, we dealt with a lot of staffing changes and reorganizations that uh, limited some of the onboarding tasks that we had in front of us. Uh, but mostly we've been working with uh, the Department of Development Services and then also our engineering department. Um, our engineering department's getting reorganized into a combined engineering and public works uh, department, and that's kind of reset their uh, process a little bit. But we are currently uh, moving ahead with some of the, uh, the work involved on that, but I do... 2021 fiscal year will be a much uh, brighter year for us than the 2020, uh, or I'm sorry, fiscal year 2022 year will be better than the 2021. Uh, we do have ArcGIS Enterprise implemented. We just uh, recently upgraded to the most recent version 10.9. And uh, we're getting ready to start uh, implementing some of what are called the ArcGIS solutions on our portal end. Uh, and ideally, we're going to have a lot of our internal workflows going through that system. Uh, primarily, the work performed uh, last calendar year was with the Morgantown Ward and Boundary Commission. And I'll have a presentation on that later today. But just uh, the highlights of that were uh, utilizing GIS to uh, provide a population and registered voter balance to all seven of the city's wards. And that actually was a, a pretty big win for GIS. And in fact, we've, we've gained some notoriety for it. And then finally, uh, we utilized GIS during our municipal election. We uh, used uh, several of the ArcGIS solutions uh, with uh, our city election. Namely, we uh, were allowing uh, poll workers to submit requests uh, utilizing Survey123 and uh, Workforce if uh, everyone's familiar with those apps. And then uh, we also utilized a uh, precinct locator. So uh, you were able to enter in your street address and go 
uh, to find the location of your polling place based on the precinct that you were in. And we also utilize a similar app to uh, link to our um, early voting sites that we had available. And finally, we went through uh, a voter satisfaction survey that was run through survey one, two, three. And we ended up getting uh, well over a hundred responses from citizens who voted in the election. And we got quite a bit of productive uh, input from uh, citizens and it was received very well by our city clerk and our city council. Uh, so those are some of the highlights. Uh, next slide. Uh, so the year ahead, we're looking at uh, onboarding several departments or getting them started anyway. Uh, we're currently working on a GIS implementation plan update to reflect uh, the calendar year 2020 holding us back in several ways. And then uh, some of the just plan projects that we have up going or upcoming uh, paper maps. Uh, we have a lot of paper records we need to get digitized and get into uh, our system. Uh, working on syncing our city addressing with Montegalia County, providing a means for us to issue new addresses and it immediately be received by Montegalia County. We're also exploring the possibility of an oblique aerial imagery flight and uh, QL2 LIDAR with uh, Montegalia County and Morgantown Utility Board as possible uh, up, upcoming projects. Uh, next slide, please. And then just finally, a quick note, uh, letting you know that uh, Montegalia County, the City of Morgantown and Morgantown Utility Board, amongst other agencies, are uh, working on developing a collaborative organization called MAGIC, the Montegalia Morgantown Area Geospatial Information Consortium. And it's designed for us to pool our resources on uh, GIS data collection projects but also to share GIS data that each of our agencies uh, hold currently. But only, not only that, that we also kind of collaborate on uh, data policies and other uh, GIS related issues that are coming up in the county. Uh, we've had quite a few productive meetings. We're currently working on uh, bylaws and uh, getting the organization formally established. So there should be a lot to come in the next calendar year. And that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Marvin. Okay, up next is Stacy McDaniel from Region 7. Good morning. Um, I am the um, GIS specialist with uh, Region 7. Our main office is in uh, Buchanan. And uh, if you go to the next slide, please. Uh, our service area is in uh, kind of north central West Virginia. We have seven counties, including Barber, Braxton, Gilmer, Lewis, Randolph, and Tucker, and Upshur. Um, and we provide services for all of the 24 municipalities located within those boundaries. Uh, next slide, please. And um, our main mission statement is to improve quality of the residents for social, economic, educational, environmental, and general aware for the region. Um, I've listed some of the services that we do. Obviously we do GIS, which is relatively new at region seven, um, but we also wanted to highlight, you know, we do funding searches, we do um, assistance with grant writing, hazard mitigation procurement. Um, we do a lot of project development, project administration and project management for um, a lot of the communities in our, in our region. Uh, we do mostly um, infrastructure, water, sewer, that sort of thing, and, and broadband now is, is a big one that's coming. Um, but we work with all kinds of different projects, strategic planning, and we offer technical assistance, uh, among others. Like I said, the GIS, I've been there for three years. We've been trying to expand that. Um, we've been working a lot with um, asset management with uh, our communities to kind of map all of their, their utility information, water, sewer, infrastructure, um, that sort of thing, as well as trying to um, encourage the use of the online services and the GIS um, within their, their individual organizations to kind of help them um, increase productivity and um, all of that kind of stuff, make things a little more seamless. 
and uh, myself as well as um, GIS from Region 1 and Region 4 are going to be presenting some of our projects um, this afternoon during the, um, the session at 245. So if you guys want to find out more about what we're doing, join us then. Thank you. Thank you, Stacy. Oh, right. Next up, we've got Jason. Good morning. How are you all? Uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to, to speak briefly here. So Hannah, if you'll roll into to my one and only slide here. As Stacy mentioned, uh, we did a lot of work with, uh, with Region 7 and Region 4, and I'm, and I'm not going to get too far in the weeds because they'll go over the nuts and bolts of that in their presentation later today. But one of the, the biggest uses we had as, as a group for GIS is really the, the data collection in terms, of, in terms of impact. You know, like Kevin said, I've been around a long time as well, uh, just like he has. And when, you know, for years, GIS to me was really nuts and bolts and really technical, uh, but it's really morphed in our region to use it as a tool for public outreach and gathering information uh, in a more practical way in terms of like the survey one, two, three, things like that. Not so much hardcore analysis, but we use it as a tool to really gauge the impact to the local economy. And what we found as, as regional councils with COVID, it was almost like a rehash of the 2016 floods and some of the previous floods. Our economy and our communities were really walloped, but nobody could get a handle on it. It was really hard to gauge the impact because nobody had data and nobody had the outreach. There wasn't a mechanism in place to ascertain really what happened. So, you know, we hats off to, to, to Carrie and Daniel with Esri. Uh, they gave us a lot of help, but what we ended up doing was producing several surveys that we pushed out. Uh, you know, as regional councils, we don't work directly with businesses a lot. We're usually on the front end getting sites prepped for, for infrastructure, things like that. But, you know, the a lot of federal agencies look at the regional councils as a conduit to do recovery and analysis and push funding out. So one of the things we had to do was really get a handle on what the impact was. And the Esri platform gave us a phenomenal tool to do that. So we ended up working on a couple of massive surveys. Uh, one was amended, amended business hours. And this was an idea we got off of some other, I don't, can't remember where, some other municipality. But, you know, during the, during the height of COVID when it was taken off, you know, a lot of stores were closed. And, you know, you may go after work, or if you had work, you, you may go to get a, a prescription field just to find out that the store was closed or it was drive up only, something like that. So we produced a survey and pushed it out to really get a good handle on, okay, is, you know, is Jim's pharmacy open or not? Uh, what, are the, what are the requirements? Do you have to call ahead? Whatever, All, you know, uh, are the, you know, is the car repair shop available? So we use that as an as a convenience thing for our communities and our members to really figure out where to find services and how to plan accordingly. And then the other survey we pushed out was a business impact survey. And it was it was a pretty thorough survey. It was it flowed really nicely. The the staff at region one, four, and seven did a great job of producing the survey, but it gauged everything from you know how many employees were laid off to the, the lost revenue. Uh, what type of what type of accommodations they had to make? What are their websites? Things like that. Uh, and we partnered with uh, a lot of our local economic development authorities, the West Virginia Development Office, and the West Virginia Chamber of Commerce on that. And that was a phenomenal snapshot of what was going on in the region. And that was the first data that was really that we feel like was filtering in and giving the local, the feds, and the state people a good handle on what was going on. And keep in mind, this was this was well before the Paycheck Protection Programs came out and a lot of this other data was gathered. And the whole point of that, the benefit of that was it gave our local communities and our, our partner economic development agencies the data to really figure out how to recover from that. You know, they they didn't know what to do. That you know before you get your marching orders, you got to know what the objective is. 
and you know we didn't give them the objective we just gave them the data to make the make the decisions and one of the the mindset that we went into with was by doing this it gives you the ability to follow up with additional surveys you know we didn't want just one picture of what was happening in in march of of 2020, you know, we needed to gauge that over several months or even several years. And doing that the way we did it, it gave us the option to go back with additional surveys. And we're actually doing that right now for some of our municipalities. But it's a great data set. And it's 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 really hard data that we are using at the regional council side to implement these recovery efforts uh, that's funded by the U US EDA. So that's really the 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 highlight of the GIS for us, you know, there, there is obviously a spatial component to it, but just the ability to push out this data in a form or to push out these surveys and grab this data in a format safely, you know, we were able to do this remotely. We had great partnerships with regional councils, state agencies, federal agencies, and again, our economic development authorities within our respective regions. And we, we attacked that from, from several sides and got some phenomenal data. And we're really proud of that and really pleased. And so we really view that this tool is, is something we're going to use forever. You know, we all have all the ones that we're going to be presenting later today. We all have enterprise agreements and it's just paid off, uh, you know, in spades. So I, I'm really looking forward to uh, Sheldon and Stacy's and, and Amanda's presentation later today. But that's kind of where we are and how we kind of adapted uh, our use of GIS during the COVID environment. So, uh, Thank you all very much for the opportunity to speak. And I'm really looking forward to see how the rest of you use GIS. Thank you so much, Jason. Thanks, Jason. Up next, we have John Tuggle from Region 4. John, did you? I'm not sure if you made it on today or not. Oh, the, yeah, yes. I'm here. Hi. Uh, yes. Uh, uh, thank you again. I, I'm, I'll just reiterate what the, the other one said. If I talked, you know, uh, Stacy and Jason, as far as the uh, work that's been going on, I didn't present a slide because they covered a lot of stuff. Uh, just briefly, though, I will add that uh, RPDCs are also encouraging our local governments, our towns, and our, our county commissions to adopt GIS format for a lot of their operations uh, as far as trying to manage their, their assets and not, not just the uh, utilities, but everything from school buses to uh, any type of transportation issues, any type of emergency services issues, any type of uh, that type of work. And, and you probably hear from Tyler Bragg sometime during this, this conference, but uh, Oak Hill has got a, a great setup that, that utilizes GIS format to, to manage the town here where I live. Uh, also, um, our in-house operations at the PDCs, especially at Region 4, we, you know, we're still working remotely, uh, and we're very efficient doing that, and a lot of that has to do with our ability to use GIS. Uh, we, we can utilize that, the, the information we can put online uh, to manage our projects, so, you know, all the information for each project we have is easily accessible uh, by clicking a dot on a map and, and that project comes up and all the, uh, all the uh, work that goes with it, all the documentation, uh, all the history, the project team, all that's uh, available, just readily available to, to, to bring up when you, uh, when you bring it up and all our, our uh, Council members can also see that when we put it out there, uh, certain parts of it that they can actually see what's going on themselves. So uh, I would just add that that uh, GIS has become a, a really big uh, part of our operations. So uh, thanks everyone for the opportunity. Thanks, John. Thank you, John. Okay, real quick before we get into the um, state agencies here, I just wanted to say we're having um, a couple of technical issues with it being a virtual conference of um, people having issues resetting their passwords on to get into the event hub, to sign in to get into the event hub. If I'm gonna have my coworker shoot something in the event hub chat for that, um, it may be because there's a lot of, 
um, attendees with like .gov email addresses or .org email addresses. So the password resets may be going to their spam. Um, we're working to get everyone attended to as quickly as possible so they can get into the event hub. Um, but just so you guys know, it's something that we're working on. And if you have anyone let you know that they're having issues, you can direct them to me. Um, it, Hannah, Joelnet, and I'll put it in the I'll put it in the chat here, or send them to um, to the Event Hub chat. So just letting you guys know we're aware of it, and we are currently working on it. Um, so with that, we will go ahead and roll into the state roll call. And first up is Rich Benz. Oh, okay. Good morning. Uh, yeah, I'm Rich Bins. I'm the uh, manager of GIS and Information Services at the uh, West Virginia Geologic and Economic Survey. Um, can I just quickly go through some of the new and exciting things we have going on here since the last WAGB8 conference? Um, so first off, uh, we have a long-running ARC IMS server. Uh, I couldn't tell you exactly how long it's been running, but it was probably one of the first ones in the state. Um, so we're slowly replacing those applications, and one of the biggest ones was the oil and gas maps. So we now have a new oil and gas map, interactive map. Um, it features a new web map. Uh, it's running an ARC server with an, a new ARC server application. But um, it still retains all the same functionalities and connectivity to the pipeline and pipeline plus database, which the old application had, um, but just with a much more user-friendly interface. And um, also the data on that is updated on a weekly basis now. Um, also from our oil and gas section, we have two new services available to maps and map services, um, which are for the Marcellus and Utica shell plays. Um, the Marcellus fund uh, formation application features completed wells, permitted wells, scan D logs, uh, options to view data and charts for completed wells. And there are also some new tools with that for uh, bookmarks, building queries, drawing, sharing maps. Um, the Utica shell play application, uh, this is a, a regional based map which features wells and auxiliary data, as well as well thin sections um, for the upper, or, uh, or do, I'm sorry, I'm not a geologist, I'm a GIS guy. So. Port of Ocodian, the Cope, the Utica, Point Pleasant, Trenton, and Black River gas plays in uh, Kentucky, New York, Ohio, Pennsylvania, as well as West Virginia. Um, for more information on that, you want to check out our geologic playbook website um, for all the details on the Utica Shell Basin ex Exploration or Interactive Map and other resources. Um, also on this slide is uh, our long running COVID mapping program. We recently received a large archive from JT Boyd, which has over 1,750 um, core logs, which we've added to our database. Um, so those that data is constantly being uh, renewed and updated, as well as uh, the mine maps. Um, we still receive active mine map information from Miners Health Safety and Training, um, from the Tax Department's Mine and Minerals section, and also periodically historic maps just pop up from an archive or somebody's garage, perhaps. And uh, we put those into the system as well. And those are constantly being updated. Um, for the next slide. Um, this is our, uh, as of uh, let's see, September, 2020, the USGS published uh, the GEMS geologic data model. This is a a standardized geodatabase schema for the format and publication of digital geologic maps. So our staff are currently working on transitioning the 1969 state geologic map, as well as about 178 1 to 24,000 scale, seven and a half minute quadrangle based maps into this new data model. Um, our field staff are also transitioning from survey one, two, three and collector applications to the new ArcGIS field maps. So the data they're collecting in the field will directly be tied to this new geologic data base as they uh, upload their data from right in the field. Um, this would also lead to our building of a new interactive statewide geologic map 
um, is going to incorporate the current digital version with the, the detailed 1 to 24,000 data where available. And this will be um, published soon in our uh, ArcGIS portal. And the third slide is our uh, West Virginia Geologic Transit map. Um, this is a GS application that was developed with the use of an ESRI story map template. Um, it's ex also accessed through our portal, our GIS portal. Um, and this features photographs of geologic rock crops taken at 84 different stops from the western border at Route 50 in Wood County, all the way across the state, uh, running eastward to Route 48 in Hardy County. Um, and it includes uh, numerous gigapan panchromatic photos of outcrops, um, some of which were provided by uh, Kaylin Bentley of the Northern West Virginia Community College um, and many of the others uh, with our own gigapan camera, which, which we re recently obtained. Um, and I think almost all 84 uh, stops on that have a gigapan photograph. And if you've not looked at those before, um, they are as large scale photographs that you can zoom in and get great detail for anywhere on the photo. So they're really interesting. Um, aside from uh, those three, those projects, uh, we've also been assisting some other agencies with projects uh, recently. Uh, one of those is the uh, West Virginia Broadband Enhancement Council. Um, we developed uh, with the, uh, with in association with the development office, uh, we integrated an OOCLA speed test with Survey123 for them, and that was used to access broadband accessibility across the state. Um, and we also combined or compiled the GS layers, GS layers uh, from, from data provided by internet providers across the state used in the developing the, the current uh, broadband availability services interactive map that is available through the uh, Broadband Enhancement Council's website. Uh, we're also working with the Secretary of State's office uh, to compile voter precinct data for every county in the state. Um, this is uh, to important to their new geo-enabled elections application, which they're working on, which will help them assist uh, exactly where registered voters should go to vote based on their address. And um, one final project we worked on um, also with the development office was updating the mine pole atlas, which we developed several years ago in association with the DEP. And they were looking to use that to identify possible geothermal applications uh, near incorporated areas um, or industrial parks. So um, yeah, that's just a, a brief overview of what we've been up to here at the geologic survey in the last two and a half, say three years. Thank you. Thank you, Rich. Thanks, Rich. Okay, up next is Steve for the Division of Forestry. Good morning, everybody. Uh, can everybody hear me okay? Yep. All right. Yes, uh, thanks, Hannah. I'm uh, Steve Harrow. I'm the GIS manager with the West Virginia Division of Forestry, and I just wanted to give you a, an update of what we've been up to with our GIS program. So <clears throat> first up is our uh, recently completed uh, update of our 10-year strategic plan. I see there's a typo there. Hannah, you must not have got the late, latest version, but it's okay. Um, we, uh, we're mandated by the Forest Service to uh, have a strategic plan in place, and that began in 2010. So 2020, we had to give an update of this. And uh, as part of that, we also uh, completed a strategic uh, uh, five-year accomplishment report, and that's called the National Priorities Addendum. And that's a uh, report of uh, submitted that details strategic accomplishments over the last five years. From a GIS standpoint, the State Forest Action Plan is a long-range planning document that uses GIS to identify priority areas around the state to address eight broad issues. And you see those <clears throat> eight broad issues there. Most of those are handled within uh, our agency by um, program managers and assistant state foresters working with stakeholders and partners. <clears throat> the last two, seven and eight, uh, forest health is handled by the uh, West Virginia Department of Agriculture. They handle all forest health issues in the state. 
And then the issue eight utilization, marketing, and economic development that was handled by uh, WVU's Appalachian Hardwood Center, which deals with forest industry in the state. But <clears throat> from the map you see there in the center with the green and blue areas, uh, you know, there's a lot of priority area GIS overlay analysis within this document. Um, and we're <clears throat> going to uh, institute uh, quite a few strategies. We, we identified uh, 39 sub issues and then also 115 strategies uh, that will be carried out over the next 10 years within these priority areas. We also identified 11 multi-state or broad regional issues, um, which uh, will work with other states to carry out um, work within those areas and, and hopefully seek grants. Uh, any kind of grants that we uh, apply for from the Forest Service, we're to reference the strategic plan and other strategic plans um, and, and also include partners, uh, strategic plans, such as West Virginia DNR's uh, um, State Wildlife Action Plan and the SCORE, the State Comprehensive Outdoor Recreation Plan. Those plans are also consulted during this process. So um, <clears throat> it was submitted to the Forest Service in December of 2020 for approval. And after passing regional requirements checklist, the plan is expected to be approved by Washington any day now. Uh, this plan is available from our website at westvirginiaforestry.com. Um, the hyperlink at the top for the for the action plan is uh, is a direct link to it if this uh, presentation is shared out so you can get to it there. So I encourage everyone to take a look at that. And next slide, Hannah. <clears throat> so uh, another update is uh, we've recently instituted, instituted Esri's cloud-based technology allowing us to collect, analyze, visualize, and most importantly, share data quickly via the web and mobile devices through 24-hour accessible applications, dashboards, graphics, and maps. Um, we're doing this mostly through Survey123, where the public has the ability to go onto a website and uh, submit uh, a notification for any kind of violation that they might uh, uh, discover, whether it's wildfire, timber theft, ginseng, illegal burning, or some logging type violation, um, as well as our foresters who initially respond to those uh, violations or the violations submitted by the public, they can uh, verify that it is a, a violation. And if there's a need for an investigator, they have a form that they can submit to uh, involve our investigators. But <clears throat> we're, we're really able to more easily track the frequency and where these incidents occur so we can look for repeat offenders. And we're using uh, webhooks uh, to automation technology to allow this to really communicate directly to the, the county forest or, or, or the investigator that would um, be needed for the, for the type of incident and where that incident occurs. And that's the, this graphic here with all the dots. Uh, this is a, a webhook example um, detailing, you know, an email that gets submitted directly to a forester from a submission to our website. Um, you know, we're just really makes us more efficient at, uh, at, you know, reacting to these violations, which is critical for emergency response or even investigations. Time is, is often critical for, for getting to these uh, locations. So some of the other graphics here, this is an example of the far right <clears throat> graphic and exa is an example of the entry form from survey one, two, three. This middle graphic is an example of an attachment that's sent with a map with all the particulars for a particular instance that's sent to our investigators. And then this is an example of a dashboard that um, we've developed to help track uh, where incidents occur. And this is good for management um, to really get an understanding of, of <clears throat> where our violations are happening, how, how many, the frequency, and really to, um, help with explaining and improving our agency's accountability to appropriators uh, so we can recover the costs and maintain a budget and, and personnel to, to help us to respond to these incidents. <clears throat> We're also looking at expanding towards uh, use of RTS online and, and uh, allowing uh, all of our staff to have a, a user account. And this would be you know, an investment into one integrated platform um, that is hopefully 
uh, way more efficient than the way we're doing business now. We just have one login for all of our, our business processes and needs and gives our staff uh, access, secure access, to DOF data sets and mapping applications needed for forest resource management and protection. We're going to include all the DOF programs uh, within this for accomplishment tracking and reporting, as well as time and activity and vehicle <clears throat> commute tracking. Um, a lot of our uh, business needs can be, you know, run through an Esri platform and, and the various apps that they have available, um, and that will really uh, streamline our business process and automate a lot of stuff and, and, and push a lot less paper. So uh, our foresters right now spend a lot of time doing uh, monthly reports, and if, if they can use a uh, so an application that allows them to enter time and activities on a daily basis. They don't have to spend the time at the end of the month trying to complete a report. And a lot of that can be automated as well. So we can move on to the next slide. <clears throat> Just want to give an update on our UAS program. Uh, we've uh, uh, had a program in place since 2018 with just one drone and one pilot. Um, but we currently have 10 UAVs and nine FAA certified pilots. Um, we really don't have a budget for this, so this is, is, you know, we're just kind of pulling from other programs to create this, but we've really found it to be beneficial. And the primary mission is to really uh, support uh, DOF programs such as uh, logging sediment control, where we do inspections on harvest jobs. We can really uh, get a, a much better picture of a logging operation. It's also safer for our, our staff. They can, they can put an aircraft up in the air and, ra and rather than trying to walk around or drive around a busy logging site. Uh, we're also using it for fire management, for uh, incidents, and also prescribed burning uh, to uh, you know, make, make sure that we get good control over those. And then also for forest management planning. We also have been providing support to other agencies such as uh, DNR and Department of Agriculture, also uh, <clears throat> the uh, Mon National Forest and uh, local uh, first responder response. Uh, some of the hardware, I'll uh, focus on that. You know, we're exclusively DGI aircraft and we we specifically have two models, the Phantom 4 and the, and the Mavic Pro. Those are really just cost effective uh, uh, you know, drones for us is really um, a good, the best bang for the buck, if you will, from from everything that that we've researched. Uh, but we are considering some drones from other manufacturers. Um, we use Apple iPads to interface with those aircraft, and then some of the software and apps that we've been able to leverage. And this is um, mostly from a cost standpoint, again, because we don't really have a budget for this program. Um, we are able to uh, use AirMap and uh, UA Sidekick uh, for airspace check authorizations, uh, also for, um, um, sorry, I lost my train of thought there. Uh, where are we getting that? Oh, yes, for uh, pre plan authorizations and uh, file N O T A M S. I'm not sure exactly what that is. I'm not a drone guy, but. Um, uh, hopefully, some of you all will understand what that is. We also use UAV forecast for weather and uh, anything related to weather and forecasts. For flight control, we're using DGI Go 4 and DGI Pilot. Uh, for mapping, uh, we're using uh, Map Pilot for flight plan uh, through their app for flight planning. And Maps Made Easy for post processing. Also, PIX 4D Capture and PIX 4D React. Um, for flight planning, image capture, and then also some post-processing. Uh, and then post-flight, we're using air data for uh, flight log and analysis uh, tracking. But that's basically, you know, the, the best software that we've been able to, to leverage from a, from a cost standpoint. Certainly, if we had, you know, a, a good budget or a larger budget, we'd be using some other uh, software site scan um, uh, from from Esri is one that we're uh, we're also considering. So, but since uh, 2018, our our pilots have logged over 800 flights and 120 hours of flight time, and we're always actively seeking opportunities to collaborate with other state and federal agencies. Um, 
Our UAS program manager is Roger Osborne and I uh, provided his contact information if you, if you wanted to get in touch with him for any type of collaborative efforts or even if you have questions about starting your own drone program because uh, we've, we've been through quite a few uh, ups and downs hurdles and, and uh, there's no sense in everybody making the same mistakes. So we're willing to share our experiences with uh, standing up a UAS program within our agency. And with that, that's all I have. Appreciate it. Thank you, Steve. Thanks, Steve. Thank you. Thanks for doing some really neat work. Yep. Welcome. And we actually did have one question in the chat for you. Um, it says, yeah. what kind of data are you collecting with the UAS? Canopy height, images, et cetera? Uh, not well, canopy height, uh, that would more be more with LIDAR, I think. If we, if we had a, a LIDAR-based uh, sensor, <laughs> which they are getting cheaper, but it's still pretty pretty, uh, pretty expensive. But um, it's mostly just documentation um, for uh, log jobs is, is, is the biggest one. Um, you know, making sure that uh, BMP com compliance is being followed by uh, logging operations. And then just awareness for you know fire management and other other planning efforts. Um, also, auditing <clears throat> we're using them to document um, audits for uh, Forest Legacy Conservation Easement Program. Um, we'll go out, we'll fly <clears throat> and observe a, a, a conservation easement, and they can go back out and and they'll save the the particulars of that particular flight, and they'll go to the exact same location, same elevation. Take another picture and then we can compare from from year to year for a for a conservation easement audit so those are the types of things great thank you so if i didn't answer your question certainly you can reach out to me and uh, i can give you more detail or point you to roger who would be the best for those types of questions so thank you of course all right next we've got jessica perkins is she still i'm here? still here yeah. Oh, great good <clears throat> hey everybody this is jessica perkins i'm the gis and technical support program manager for um uh, wvdnr wildlife resources and i'm actually calling all the way from west uh, yellowstone montana this morning um i'm on vacation so but really felt a duty to uh wvagp all of you guys and especially uh, to my agency to, to try to be on today and at least give this five minute update. <laughs> so um, I am also the vice president for WVAGP currently, and I've been on the conference planning committee. Um, unfortunately, we, we uh, planned this vacation uh, before we had a date for the conference and uh, this date, this, you know, date, these dates worked the best for everyone else. So um, but I'm here at least for a little bit and really enjoyed hearing what all the other agencies are up to. Um, so uh, my, uh, the GIS and technical support program, of course, covers um, all of our GIS needs um, with wildlife resources, but we also do uh, a lot of planning. Um, recently, I've been involved with some natural resource management planning, but also fiscal planning, um, and we cover um, data systems. We're going to be starting a new data systems assessment when I get back from vacation um, with an outside consultant. Um, and recently we hired someone who will really be focusing not, uh, on planning, but also on uh, human dimensions of wildlife resources. So pushing out more surveys to our anglers and hunters and outdoors uh, people and, um, and getting a better idea of how we can better um, serve our constituents. So um, that's a that's a neat uh, place that we're 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 going to be growing. I think into the future. Um, despite COVID, we are growing, and um, you know it's been a it's been a rough couple uh, or year and a half, but we have been growing. I've actually hired uh, hired two people since um, you know during during when we were working from home even. Um, and we have several, you know, many new biologists on staff um, that have a lot of technical and GIS expertise. Um, and, um, and, and I see that really continuing to grow into the future. 
And, you know, and I am also seeing GIS growing in the state, which is, you know, a, a really great thing. And I can, you know, we can see that in our, our local governments. Um, I know even Elkins now has a GIS uh, specialist. So uh, it's, it's, it's a really exciting time to be a part of this organization and a part of this growth. Um, but we, uh, in, uh, in, in, here in uh, Wildlife Resources, we support, um, you know, many different um, groups, environmental coordination, fish management, uh, game management, and then wildlife diversity and natural heritage. Um, and uh, along with that growth, we have some newish staff, although Brandy will probably get um, you know, upset with me. I'm going <laughs> to add her to the, to the slide here. She's actually been with us for over four years. Um, you know, started as a student hire and has moved up the ranks. Um, really great uh, person to work with. Um, but now she is, uh, you know, since our last roll call about a year and a half ago, she came on full time. So really happy to have her on board as a GIS programmer analyst one. And we also have Meryl Friedrich, who is our GIS programmer analyst too. She took over my old position and really great to have her on board. Um, um, great experience in analysis um, and species uh, distribution modeling, which um, and other modeling, which she, she has a presentation later this afternoon, which I encourage you to, to tune into. Um, and then of course our um, tried and true staff um, Steve Gibson will be online some. He's our database administrator and does all things computer for the Elkins Operations Center. Jeremy Rowan is still on staff, kind of operates as our GIS technician, all things mapping, printing, uh, laminating, et cetera. And then Chris George is still on board uh, dealing with our Trimble GPSs and some of our other GPS uh, equipment. Um, and then uh, just going into some, some uh, ongoing and completed projects, sort of the high level things. Um, we, uh, we continue to support the interactive hunting and fishing map, which um, we work with the West Virginia GIS Technical Center. Um, they host it and did the programming for it a few years ago. Um, but we uh, do uh, sometimes more than two, but definitely two updates per year of data with them. And then just throughout the year, continue to update that data. Um, you know, Jeremy is out uh, doing boundary work and, and getting those data updated and other new data inputted into the system. And Brandy's taken over, um, you know, getting those updates over to the technical center. Uh, we also are continuing with the lake bathymetry project. If you go to the fishing side of the hunting and fishing map and you zoom into some of our especially smaller lakes, um, you'll notice that um, some bathymetry uh, lake depth data pops in. And uh, we've been doing all of that data collection in-house and data processing in-house. Um, most of the small lakes that are boat accessible are done or completed. Um, we have seven large lakes to finish in the state and we hope to do those in the next few years. Uh, we continue to be involved with the Watershed Resources Registry, uh, which is really a, a EPA uh, um, funded project, but it's very centered in uh, working with, um, with state agencies and other federal agencies within the state. And I would, I would um, encourage you to, to check out that website and that web map. Um, it's changing, we're adding new data and continuing to grow and improve um, that site. So, and it, it actually links into several other web tools as well now too. Um, uh, this is a little old now, but the, the um, we, ha we have the um, West Virginia, Land cover completed. We funded um, at least part of some of that work with Dr. Michael Strager and Dr. Aaron Maxwell at the Natural Resource Analysis Center at WVU. And it was completed at the end of 2019 and it's now downloadable on the West Virginia GIS data clearinghouse. So take a look at that. Um, can you go to the next slide, please? Okay, so... Um, 
like others that I've, we've heard from this morning, we've really been um, growing our um, ArcGIS online and pushing out surveys on survey one, two, three, as well as hosting some story maps. Um, the Firefly uh, Citizen Science um, data collection has ended, but we are pushing out, it hasn't, the, this URL hasn't been updated yet um, to the new story map, but it should be in the next few, uh, few weeks. And, um, and Brandy built a new story map for the Firefly. Um, and it's looking really good. Uh, got a, a, a lot of, um, a lot of uh, input from that over 2000 entries uh, for, for the for the Firefly citizen science and um, uh, last I guess right in the beginning of COVID um, with one of our biologists I built the box turtle citizen science data collection survey one two three and um, and pushed that out and the biologist was very good about putting out um, information um, on our Facebook and, um, and other um, news outlets. And we were completely blown away that um, we got over, we now have, and I think last year it was the, the thousands and thousands, but um, we now have over 7,000 entries to the box turtle survey, which just, we, we just, it just far surpassed our expectations. Um, for what you know, the citizens of West Virginia would do, would provide and collect data. Um, the box turtle survey was a little easier than the firefly one, um, uh, but we've it's you know it's been a great um, collaboration, and um, and I think probably we got a lot more people interested in it because um, of COVID and wanting to get out with their families and collect you know information and. And, you know, box turtles are pretty awesome. So thank you if you were involved with that and collecting data for us. Um, and then in, we have several internal survey one, two, threes um, that uh, we've pushed out. Brandy's been mostly involved with those now. And, and you know, really in the last year we've, we've been, because I've, you know, moved into the manager position, we've kind of been slowly moving these projects and uh, transitioning and changing how we're dealing with them and who's you know in charge of them. So um, that's that's been you know an interesting um, transition too, and and has gone really well because we have we have really great staff. So um, we continue to use Avenza Maps. Um, it's just been really easy to implement, um, and <clears throat> we can even do some basic data collection. Um, but um, it's uh, it, it's been you know we've had over uh, eleven thousand uh, map store downloads and um, and it's that's been a really great um, great addition and a great way to just easily push out information to the public and also to use internally uh, for our, our you know our field staff to be able to have some location information readily available you know, on their cell phones and easy to use. Um, we continue to uh, use Trimble devices. We're implementing the R1 uh, GNSS receivers with iPads. Our forestry folks have been starting to use those quite a bit and, uh, and we'll be continuing to test that and um, work with that more. We also recently purchased a Trimble Nomad 5 um, with an ex, uh, uh, with a connected EM100 GNS module. And, um, and Chris has been working with that to get that out and, and working for Jeremy to collect um, data. So um, we should be seeing a new uh, DNR website um, being released soon and we'll be updating our branding to match what it looks like on our new website. We're way overdue of needing a new DNR website um, and, um, and really excited to see what that's going to look like and, and, and integrating our GIS and uh, cap you know, cap online capabilities into that website as well. Okay, next slide, and this is my last one. Um, we're continuing. I mean, this is just an ongoing thing, server upgrades. Um, we're going to be implementing portal soon. 
Um, and then, of course, just that ever present uh, building of metadata and data cleanup that just seems to be an ongoing thing. Um, as far as analysis goes, uh, Merrill is really the, the lead in this, this realm now, um, but also Brandy has been working on some of these things. Um, the Grouse Habitat Management Priority Tool is one of the first projects that Merrill took over when she became the GIS analyst too. And, um, and has really run with it, working with our new small game biologists in Elkins. The chronic wasting disease model is actually Brandy Bachman's master's degree project, and she's continuing to work with it and clean it up and get it usable for yeah, our biologists. Excuse me? Tax I think office someone moved to the magistrate's court building. I think someone needs Down to Out of the meet. corner, make a right. Go half a block across the street. There's two flagpoles out front. I'm hearing someone talking that needs to be yeah, muted. So, someone mute your phone. Or your okay, I think I got it, Jessica. Okay, thank you. So um, Brandy Bachman just finished her master's degree. Congratulations. And that chronic wasting disease model was part of it. Um, also, uh, later today, Merrill will be pre presenting on the Landscape Integrity Index update. Um, she's also working on many habitat suitability models with, um, with our staff in uh, at biologists, um, prioritizing with the species of greatest conservation need um, that are uh, part of the State Wildlife Action Plan. They just uh, completed a wood rat model and starting field surveys based on it and um, finished an Indiana bat model, um, which will likely be put in use this fall. Uh, we have several other models that we're working with partners on. Dr. Crystal Krauss from Davis and Elkins College is completing uh, threatened and endangered species plant models. And um, we recently received the new Cheat Mountain Salamander model that Lacey Rucker has been working on for her PhD in Dr. Donald Brown's lab at WVU. And that's gonna be really a, a nice thing to have for some of our biologists and work we do. Um, there's a, a new project coming on board that Merrill's been working with, a stream integrity index and um, you know, that might be a good one next year to report on. In the future, we're um, in talks with NatureServe to look into building an environmental review tool, uh, which will be a great addition, um, not only for internal use for our, our uh, coordination biologists, um, but also um, for outside con uh, consultants and um, folks working on projects throughout the state. Um, then um, uh, we're also helping our, the DNR's Office of Land and Streams to potentially build an online mapping tool with the West Virginia GIS Technical Center. And this would be, to, for starters, it would be an internal online mapping tool. They don't have any GIS. Um, folks on board in their office, but we would wind up training them on how to use it and I think would really serve them well to have that capability. Um, we are uh, looking into building a wildlife management area project tracking tool, um, you know, using um, Survey123, Collector, and other uh, more modern um, coll uh, data collection uh, capabilities. And then finally, um, we are looking at also um, one uh, benefit of me being involved with some of this fiscal planning is that I've been able to secure some funding to start a very small program in uh, UAS and look at getting uh, Phantom 4 Pro and then the Esri drone mapping collection. So um, it'll be a, a neat uh, arena to, to, to move into. Um, as Steve Haruff mentioned, they've done a little bit of flying for us on, on a lake, uh, and we hope to collaborate with them. Um, we've also worked with Paul Kinder at the West Virgin, with the, at WVU at the Natural Resource Analysis Center, and we'll continue to work with him because he just has all the great, you know, LIDAR gadgets and, and uh, more advanced um, UAS, and, and, um, and he's been a great partner to work with, so... 
Um, I think that's my, that's, that is my last slide. And I hope you all have a wonderful meeting. I'm gonna be um, signing off here in a few minutes uh, just because I am on vacation, <laughs> but uh, I, you know, I really appreciate uh, you all and, and, um, and it's, it's great to be a part of this organization. So I hope you all have a great couple of days. Thank you, Jessica. Yeah, Thanks, and Jessica, thank you. thanks for calling vacation. in and enjoy your vacation. Thanks, take care. All right, next we had Tony Cemental. I'm not sure if he was able to make it this morning. So we will just move right along to Yiming Wu, which I believe they are here. Yep. Yeah, I'm here. Thank you, uh, Hannah. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, in case you don't know me, uh, my name is Yiming Wu. I'm one of the assistant division directors for this new division called Strategic Data Management and Technology that has been set up. Uh, quick pause. Can you hear me well? We're doing good. Okay, thank you. Um, since I was uh, told um, that it's just five minutes for me to present, so I only have two slides. The first one, you already saw that. So this, this is the second one. I'm trying to uh, squeeze everything into um, this slide. Um, quick updates from us. Um, we've been through uh, several rounds of restructuring. And uh, now uh, we are in this division called uh, Strategic Data Management and Technology. And as some of you uh, may know, Hussein Alcanza, and he is the director of this new division. And um, my role in this division is to supervise the geospatial program, which um, is composed of two sections. And um, the first one is the traditional GS section uh, with three units included, including GS services, mapping services, and uh, linear referencing system or LS services. And um, in the uh, geospatial program, there's a secondary section. We name it as geospatial infrastructure section. And uh, there are also three units inside. And one is highway data services. And the second one is just programming. And the third one is the fleet management. Uh, based on the latest organ chart, there are 32 full-time positions uh, in this program, and we also have temps. So there are some uh, uh, temps on board as well. And um, we are Azure Shop. Uh, as of now, we are running ArcGIS 10.8.1. And basically, we have a full suite of uh, Azure ArcGIS applications, including Desktop Pro, ArcGIS uh, Enterprise, ArcGIS Online, and those major extensions. Um, Hand that click, please. Um, we just we stay pretty busy, and um, um, what we are doing is mainly service driven. Uh, in other words, we are the one providing your special services to our agency, aka DOT. And um, um, I put it down a list of bullets here. Um, um, you know, this list I can keep going. And uh, I just named a few uh, major ongoing uh, mission critical uh, uh, projects. Um, the first one is the core maintenance plan, CMP. Uh, you may have noticed on our website, we, DOT's website, we put a uh, link to uh, uh, give uh, the citizens of West Virginia access to ongoing um, DOH uh, projects, uh, including um, paving, um, patching, um, stabilization, um, roads to prosperity, uh, paving, slide, uh, slide, et cetera. Another major uh, project on our end that we are supporting is the uh, Enterprise Resource Planning or ERP project. Yeah, this has been uh, going on for a while and uh, we, are in, we are in a new phase uh, or our own uh, phase. And as you know, the purpose of ERP is to um, retire old mainframe-based applications and uh, replace them with uh, modernized 
more advanced uh, applications. So uh, we are still doing the project. And um, the third one I put down here is Maya 2.0, which is a new requirement from FHWA, um, 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 Federal Highway Administration of the US DOT. And um, we are required to collect data for 205 uh, data elements. Um, along uh, road network. And uh, there are two data lines. The first data line involves in 38 data elements, which are due um, uh, September 30th, 2026. And the rest of the data elements are due uh, during the second phase. And the, the data collection involves both the state maintained and the non state maintained roads. Uh, in other words, uh, we need to have the data available for both uh, uh, state roads and the local roads, and which sounds uh, a uh, really challenging project to all of us. And uh, so sometime later, we may need to, we may uh, reach out to the uh, West Virginia GIS user community and ask for help. Please uh, be uh, prepared and uh, be nice to us. Um, uh, the next one is the Roads to Prosperity project. Uh, we also have some information on our website. If you want to know details, you can uh, check uh, DOT's website. Um, and uh, of course, we are on our end, we keep doing uh, just spatial data collection. And uh, Steve, a while ago, mentioned the, mentioned the uh, Forestry's UAS program, and uh, we are setting up one like that. And we have two people trained to uh, uh, trained it to be uh, um, to be um, drone pilot, and we are working with Azri to um, try the uh, side scan and um, and uh, drone to map applications. Um, yeah, we uh, we hope um, that will give us a new way to collect the data along our highway network. And um, also, uh, we keep promoting GIS or LS technology in our agency. And we're working with AGP and the GIS Tech Center to provide GIS training to our uh, DOT GIS user community. Yeah. And, and click, please, Hannah. Um, there are some opportunities on our end, uh, as you see. Um, there are 32 full-time positions uh, in our program as of now. Um, um, about 20 positions have been filled up and we still have uh, uh, about um, 12 positions um, available. Um, well, a big reason is um, we, are not that much, we are not that much competitive in terms of pay, but if you just look at the uh, state uh, agency GS programs actually were very competitive. And um, DOT is the only agency as of now that is uh, approved by legislature to match the pay structure of the federal government. So, uh, and if you, are, you know, if you are interested, especially if you are, want to take, take challenges, uh, please join us. We have uh, uh, positions from entry level to um, to the uh, middle and the uh, senior level and the plus uh, supervisors. And if you are interested uh, after the meeting, uh, send me uh, uh, send me your resume. And also, whenever a, a position uh, is available, I will have the post in uh, shared on the uh, HT uh, message board. Um, before I end my talk, I want to mention you know, that there are some technology changes on our end. Uh, one thing is the transition to ArcGIS Pro. Um, we are sort of um, tied to ArcGIS Desktop because of a uh, special um, application called the Roads and Highways that uh, we are using to manage highway road network. Um, for the time being, uh, the roads to highway Road and highways extension to uh, ArcGIS Pro is not uh, ready for us yet. It may it may be ready for some uh, uh, 
other DOTs nationwide, but not ready for us. So transitioning to Actis Pro with Acti with uh, road and highways uh, included is going to be a challenge to our end and to us. And um, the next one uh, is the transition to Google uh, Suite. Uh, you know, um, this is ongoing by the state OT, and this affects everybody who works for the state, especially if you are part of the uh, uh, GIS industry, uh, what are we going to do? Um, um, you know, Google uh, product is kind of uh, uh, closed and you cannot use it in the face. And if you run uh, some other applications for your business and back at DOT, we have two uh, content management systems uh, project wise and um, app extender. Uh, as of now, uh, Google all Google's business, business partners don't have uh, um, alternatives to replace the two content management systems. And also there are no direct ways to uh, communicate between uh, Google, uh, uh, Google um, Suite, for example, um, or Google application, for example, uh, Gmail with uh, project-wise or app extender, which uh, becomes a big challenge to us. And we are hoping to get exemption from the state OT, but um, um, we'll still need to uh, prepare for the no from uh, OT. And that's the second one. The, the next one is uh, the adoption of other new technologies. Um, as you may know, we maintain a large set of official highway maps for uh, West Virginia. Um, uh, we are trying to um, marry um, the traditional uh, cartographic uh, uh, tools with the, some advanced ones. Um, and for example, we want to use both uh, ArcGIS and uh, um, Adobe CC to make our maps look prettier. And, and that's something we are trying. Last but not least, uh, speaking of contributing to the uh, West Virginia GIS community, um, we uh, have um, our data, uh, maps, applications, GIS services, et cetera, all placed on uh, DOT's open data portal. Uh, if you do a Google search, uh, you can find that uh, all the uh, resources we, uh, we have are grouped together and uh, you can easily uh, um, get them. And um, also we, um, we have one rep representative, Mr. Aaron Ferrari representing us, um, sitting on the HEP board. And um, as far as I know, um, uh, Mr. Andrew Dodge uh, was nominated. I hope um, he's gonna win another seat uh, this time. And um, if you um, uh, need something from us uh, or have questions for us or have suggestions for us, uh, please uh, email um, GP uh, helpdesk at wb.gov or me. Uh, I watch the two email uh, accounts closely, except for when I'm on, on the road. Okay. Uh, thank you and uh, thank you for the opportunity. Um, um, let me know if we can help, and we're always around. Thanks, Yumin. Thank you. Um, and then just real quick in the last couple of minutes here, we've got, um, let's go to Jeff. Um, he's here with the, with our federal speakers. Hey, Hannah, can you hear me? Yes. All right. So this is my second time being able to make it uh, to the WBAGP conference. Glad I could just get a few minutes really just to try to explain who we are. Uh, so we're the National Geodetic Survey. As you can see up there, we're part of NOAA. Uh, so we're, a lot of folks confuse us with USGS, the US Geological Survey, but we're a separate entity altogether. We do work with them when we can. And then another thing people always wonder when I talk is, well, what is it that you, what is it that you guys do there at NGS? And really what we do is what I've got underlined there. We maintain the nation's geodetic infrastructure. You know, we've heard a lot about infrastructure recently. And so I'll, I'll just highlight that as, uh, you know, our nation's datums are the geodetic infrastructure that underpins really 
uh, the framework of the backbone of all efficient uh, GIS analysis, right? Uh, I mean, think about it, you know, without common datums, we would all need to just spend lots of time trying to find ways to align our data sets, right? And we even still have to do that sometimes, but uh, just imagine if uh, NAD 83 and NAVD 88 didn't exist at all. Uh, so those two datums are really the primary visible products that you see and they're part of if you see that bullet there the national spatial reference system that's our our acronym the nsrs uh, what else do we do we gather and publish data from these continuously operating reference stations those are continuously operating gps reference stations that we call cores right so we gather that data from other agencies uh, mostly as we operate very few of those stations ourselves uh, our goal is to, to serve that data out to the public, right? Uh, so I'll give a quick shout out to uh, WV. Uh, the DOH has 25 or so stations that's continuously operating GPS reference stations across the state. What do they do, right? Well, they're used across the entire geospatial community uh, for post-processing GPS data, right? So like your UAV or drone data that was talked about earlier, or the bathymetry data that was talked about earlier when that type of information is collected uh, it's typically post-processed to gps data like our cores data okay and then that last bullet there is we build geoid models right what does that mean that's those how you get your elevations or heights out of gps okay without a geoid model you know those heights or elevations that come from your gps receivers they could not properly allow you to really do the things that we do now, like building topographic contours or doing a water flow or hydraulic analyses. Uh, the geoid model is what adds that gravity component to that, uh, that height or elevation. So you really uh, can analyze GPS-based data um, to look at water flow. That's the most important thing, really. Uh, touches a lot of people, right? Water flow, floods, uh, resources of the rivers, et cetera, et cetera. So, so you can go ahead and hit the next slide, Hannah. And uh, that's my last slide, that second one. And so what I want to talk about, I, I mentioned that we build the datums, right? And so if you've been hearing me or other NGS personnel talk the past few years, you've been hearing about those new datums that we planned for release next year in 2022. However, that is delayed. So we're talking more around the 2024 five timeframe, but I do wanna give you a look at what right now is a draft. Uh, so the names are staying 2022. So there you see on the right-hand side of this slide is the state plan coordinate system of 2022 for West Virginia, or at least a, a draft, uh, right? It's not finalized yet, but it's uh, pretty close. And so as compared to what on the left, is SPCS of 1983. What do we know about SPCS 83? Well, we've got those two zones, the north and the south, right? Uh, and in working with and talking to the user communities, most folks, especially the GIS community, like the idea of that single statewide zone on the right. And so I was down um, at a couple different conferences and online and stuff the past year to talk to the surveying community of West Virginia, and they really like that idea too. Why split the state up in the North and South if we could do uh, a single statewide zone and still meet the needs of that user community? And uh, those color shadings are, uh, they're the same, um, same color scale on both those maps. And what it represents is linear distortion. We don't have enough time to get into that today, but I just wanted to highlight, you see there's a lot more green on that uh, map on the right-hand side as compared to the north and south zones that we currently use in SPCS 83. And that's the idea there is that we're creating lower linear distortion, okay? Um, and so the other thing I'll mention real quick uh, is that skew line that you see, it doesn't run north-south. Uh, the most important takeaway from the map is that even though there's a skew azimuth or a skew axis in that single statewide zone, north is still north, okay? That doesn't change 
where north is in the coordinates. Uh, and I had a lot of questions about that, so I just wanted to show that. And if you have further questions about SPCS 2022 or the new datums or anything else, feel free to look us up and reach out to me. I appreciate getting a few minutes uh, just to talk about who we are at the National Geodetic Survey. Thanks, Hannah. Thank you, Jeff. Okay, and then last but not least will be Catherine. And I'm actually going to stop my share and she will share her slides on her end. You're still muted, Catherine. It wouldn't let me do it there. Okay, ready there you when go. you are. Yeah, and this is this is going to be the last session of the day. So, or sorry, last session of of this. The morning. <laughs> yes, of the roll calls, and so the state society um, session has began. It it started just a couple minutes late, but it, they just got started. It's actually in a different session than what's currently going on right now, since we're running a couple minutes late here. Um, so just so everyone knows to access that session, you'll have to go back to the event hub and then click on the link for that session. So just so everyone knows. All right, go ahead, Catherine. Okay. Well, given that, I will uh, try and be efficient with my time. Uh, Thank you. It is. There we go. Okay. Um. All right, not a whole lot of fancy graphics in mind, but basically I am both the uh, GIS person with the Water Science Center in West Virginia, and also uh, an associate national map liaison since Craig retired, actually part of all he was still here, but now he's retired. So I'm filling in that role. Um, and let's see, you say, slideshow. I'll get it started as a slideshow. From beginning. All right. So in the USGS is a broad umbrella, as we all know, national map things going on in West Virginia, Water Science Center, there's cooperative geologic mapping going on, as uh, um, we talked about a little earlier, and uh, and biological and ecology work also goes on here. We're going to, I'm going to focus on the national map and the water science center work because that is what I am most familiar with. Hmm. Oh, did I go too fast? Nope. Okay, first up, the national map. Most of you are familiar with this. I just took a screen grab of a few different things mostly so we didn't have to click and go to the internet. Um, so you got your national map viewer, and from there you can download data such as uh, last files for uh, LIDAR. You can download basically things that the USGS is responsible for. Um, we also have uh, a user engagement section, which I'll talk about a little bit later. That's the citizen science thing that everyone is talking about. <laughs> and um, we also have a... Uh, you know, we're responsible for national digital trails now, which is something a little new. Uh, and I'll talk about it in a little more detail of some of those things. Is that, it? oh, okay. Um, upcoming ideas and things in development for the national map. Right now they're in beta and it hasn't been released yet, but we're gonna be able to do customized one to 24,000 maps. Uh, for those who are interested, you'll be able to just zoom in wherever you want it. And so if you live right on the border of four topo maps, it won't have to happen anymore. You can have a topo map of your house or your business or whatever um, on a topo map that you can then download once you've made it on this app. Um, I've used it. Uh, there are several different kinds of scenarios they've asked us to try and run, like a fire one and different things like that. And it's actually pretty cool and it, it works really pretty well. I think that uh, given comments back to them, that might be coming live somewhat soon. Um, one of the things that I'm pretty excited about is the uh, elevation-derived hydrography. Uh, there are several test areas for how this will proceed, including, you know, there's things like conflation issues from the uh, highest res NHD that exists now for West Virginia. Um, there have been several webinars hosted by the NISJIG. If you have access to those webinars, that's a good place to find some things more about um, 
somebody introducing the concepts of it all. But there is also a uh, web page that you can go to that discusses the specifications for what needs to be available for this process. There are currently several test cases going on right now. I think one is in Indiana. There are not any in here in West Virginia, but um, close by. Uh, I think this is going to be definitely a really strong area in, in um, uh, data processing in West Virginia because we're all getting used to LIDAR. And when you drop the NHD on the LIDAR, sometimes you see streams going over hillsides and things like that. So that, that'll be pretty exciting. Um, Bathymetry and LIDAR is also coming along there. We've got a current one that you can download, I believe, uh, from the uh, national map that is a bathymetry of the Potomac River between Maryland and DC, essentially, but it's in the uh, Chesapeake Bay area. That's why it got the money and the research and <laughs> to do that. Um, so the National Digital Trails Network will soon be available on the national map, but it's currently viewer, uh, viewable in a uh, web application on rgis.com. Um, and then the citizen science, and I have a few different slides about that. Okay, first up, the three debt program, um, LIDAR data. West Virginia, this graphic here is just showing progress of projects that are current. I'll have another one that'll show a little bit more detail about what's going on. But um, we have got uh, all of West Virginia um, is pretty much either done and delivered or soon to be done and delivered. The Eastern Panhandle that's showing is white right now has LIDAR available already. So we don't show it as active right now because it's not an active uh, program right now. Um, there is an, a, WCMS, a WCS application that you can load into ArcMap or ArcPro where you can look at a, the United States, um, the whole United States has elevation data available of varying quality, um, but they have seamed it together and you can load it into your ArcMap, add other data into it, um, get with me later and I can talk about talk with you about where to find this. Uh, Anyway, um, as you zoom in and out, it dynamically changes the um, high and low values, for instance, in the, in the uh, table of contents. Story maps by the USGS. I just thought of some interesting things that might, that might be of interest to people. In uh, 2019, actually, it was the 150th anniversary of um, uh, Powell, Lewis, yeah, J.W. Powell's expedition down the Colorado River. And the USGS partnered with some researchers in Wyoming. And we took a uh, trip down the, <laughs> the same path that he went on, although in more uh, advanced boats, <laughs> I believe. Anyway, uh, this story app is from a remote sensing perspective. And it's a really interesting application if anyone wants to go and see that one. All right, so now the Water Science Center hat. Um, I have been responsible for preparing the data sets to get stream stats up and going. We are in the QW phase, basically, of the app, and I can show you a brief picture of it, um, but it is either going to go live in uh, July or August, one or the other. There are some other publishing things that have to happen first, and we're really right on the cusp. Um, I think it really still could possibly be July, even though July is right, you know, around the corner. They push data up once a month, essentially, to the national uh, stream stats site. And so one, once some publications are underway, then that can happen. Uh, and I'm actively working on that, although with some connection issues, so not everything is working. But um, we also have got um, several... Uh, site maps for the sites in the USGS uh, that have been made by people actually in the Virginia office that I'm working with um, and ongoing. So here is stream stats for West Virginia. It starts out with um, this sort of screen. The hatched areas are areas you can't click. So you can't click on a stream outside of West Virginia to do any um, flow statistics. That's what stream stats is all about, is, is collecting flow statistics. 
but you can also get um, drainage characteristics. And I put in a whole bunch of different drainage characteristics, including land cover, precipitation, uh, lots of different da uh, data sets. So you build scenarios, you have to zoom way in, you're gonna click on a, uh, a digital stream, basically made from the elevation data. And uh, like I said, it'll be probably July, but possibly August. There's a neat story map about loads and trends in the Chesapeake Bay uh, non-titling, uh, non-tidal monitoring network. Um, that one is also very well written and document, and it's a it's a good example. Even if you're not interested in that data, it's actually a good example of a story map, I think, because it it's very techy science, but it reads really well for even somebody who doesn't know exactly what total nitrogen results mean. Um, if you do and you're interested. That's up as well. I, I, by the way, I don't know why this little thing kept telling me no NVIDIA rating unknown. <laughs> that was a little bit of an unknown for me, but anyway. Uh, the USGS has got this national water dashboard where you can go, uh, they're, they're trying different things. There's different ways you can go and see this information, right? Up till now, it's been sort of state by state, but um, the uh, USGS, groups have been putting together this national map, which shows you the, uh, you can look at lakes, wells, water quality, rain monitoring that we've done and atmospheric monitoring and tidal information. And you can add weather conditions also. Um, this is available online. It says right here, it's experimental. <laughs> I'm not entirely sure. I think that what that's their way of, that's our way of saying that there might be some bugs we have to work out still, but, uh, that's a real interesting and good application. I use this actually fairly often um, in my work. Oh, end of slideshow. Okay, so there we go. Um, any questions? Thank you, Catherine. Catherine, thank you very much. All right. Okay. So um, if everyone wants to jump over to the State Society reports, just head back to the Event Hub and click on the link to join those reports. So for everyone who's still on the Zoom, um, I, know, I know we're running just a little bit late, so we're going to get started on the other side. And I know that there's a little confusion still about the Event Hub, so I'm going to share my screen really quick so that people can see what that looks like. When you guys, <clears throat> if you're if you're still here on the JewelNet web page, so JewelNet Swugu, you should have those links. There is a button right here on the top left under the home. That's the event hub. It should request. Um, yeah, sorry, wasn't sharing. Yeah, you hadn't. Top left, uh, under event under home, there should be an event hub. That's a little link that you should guys be able to click on. And it'll, if you need to register or um, log in, it'll ask you to log in. This is how all of your sessions will run. <clears throat> and this on the right hand side gives you links to the view sessions, um, which includes the society report. So if you were to click on, for example, view session, that's going to take you over and it'll open up the next link for the Zoom meeting. So if you didn't Okay. accept all of those calendar invites from everyone um, or from the JewelNet folks and they're not on your calendars, that's where you get all of um, your event hub is where you get all of the links to all of the Zooms, which it would include the paper presentations in the afternoon and the workshop, workshop sessions tomorrow, okay? So if you have questions, feel free to chat with, uh, with us or the, the JewelNet people um they'd be willing to help you out okay so everybody should be able to go back to the event hub and click over to the state society reports and we're going to get started here directly okay see you over there thanks everyone